yoked to him in his work. You know, when you give in to things like House of Hope Africa, when you care for your neighbour, when you look, uh, don't stand and turn a blind eye to injustice, you're yoked to Jesus, to his ministry in big and in small ways. And I just want to encourage you that however big or small your actions might be, you know, as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, um, his strength, um, being yoked to him, means that he's doing the heavy lifting, really. The, the, the younger oxen would often learn from the older uh, in how to do that work. And we're yoked to Jesus. And I want to encourage you just to bind yourself to Christ be moved by his heart, be moved by what moves him. And I get that all the time when I read the scriptures. And today I want to share with us actually around um, how Jesus shared faith, how he connected people to the heavenly father. And we're going to speak primarily today, I'm going to share with you out of John 4, uh, 1 to 30 from the New Living Translation. But, you know, we're in a season where people are, people are hurting. We, we see young people that are, have practical needs for food and for, for community and for care. But also we're in a season post-COVID where I'm finding and I'm seeing as a pastor that the pressure of what we've been through is starting to catch up with people on an emotional level. And many of you, like I, will be feeling that. We're feeling that, that the pressures that we've been under take a toll. And I want to encourage you prophetically today that Jesus loves you and he is going to bring you through this. We sang that last song. I've caught up with a number of people over the past couple of weeks that are just feeling that the stresses and the strains and what you shared this morning, Sue, around being uh, casting our cares on Jesus, that is so true. And we need to find moments, you know, where we can just linger and just be still, not with many words, but just in the presence of Jesus. And we're going to open up the altar here at the end of the service today and we're going to take time to pray for you, to minister to you. And if you need strength today, I want you to know that the Lord is going to meet you here today. He wants you to know that. But I want to share with us today, there's a whole lot of hurting people out there, people in need. And I was reading an article actually about the number of Google kind of searches, people just searching for prayer went up by something like 80%, some huge amount than the baseline. And that's a really good indicator in a modern age of where people are at, or at least a percentage of the population. They're Googling prayer. How do I get prayer support? And this was across a lot of denominations and secular people just reaching out for God. And so we're in a season where we've got something to give, you and I. We have a living hope. You know, when Jesus died and he rose again and he opened a way for us to have a relationship with the Father, he then sent his Holy Spirit to live within us and to be with us. And, uh, you know, he is a light in a dark place. And there are so many out there searching for faith, for hope and for meaning in life, especially through difficult times. And I want to take us to, as I said, a passage, John 4. 1 to 30, and I'm going to read through this, and here we have an encounter that Jesus has with someone who's very different from him, uh, someone who um, is, there, there are a lot of different uh, barriers really on many levels. It's a woman, she's a Samaritan, someone who's very different from Jesus, but he takes this opportunity to share with her. And I believe there's something in this interaction that Jesus has with her that we can draw from today. And I'm going to read to us. Uh, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptising and making more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptise them. His disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. And here we see that Jesus, we see the humanity of Jesus, don't we? He's weary, he's tired, 
is thirsty. And when it comes to sharing our faith with a, a world that is in need, often these opportunities that we get aren't convenient, are they? You might have come back from a long day at work. You might be catching public transport. You might have stopped in to get a coffee somewhere. And these opportunities arise. And the last thing you want to do sometimes is give of yourself. Jesus felt weary. He felt tired. But sometimes these are the opportunities that we just need to push through and take them because on the other side of that, um, there's gold. And, uh, and, you know, it also gives the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work through you because it's often not by our strength and by our might, but these opportunities come about that God might be given glory. And so here we see Jesus' humanity. And, you know, Paul speaks to Timothy about this very thing uh, in the Scriptures. If we look over at 2 Timothy 4.2, um, Paul says to Timothy, preach the word of God, be prepared, whether the time is favourable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. And so often, you know, in this particular case with Paul and Timothy, Paul's in jail. He's about to be executed and he's encouraging Timothy on how to handle the word of God. And often, as in Paul's case and in the case here of Jesus, it's not an opportune time. We can feel weak, tired and weary, but the opportunities are there. I've started doing just a bit of work on the side on my days off where I do a bit of Ubering. And this week, I was kind of at the end of the day and I picked up this young lady uh, in Wollongong and I'm taking her to a particular spot where she needed to go. But I noticed she had a lame arm. She'd been in an accident and she'd never heard about Jesus before, but I just felt prompted to share faith with her. And so I'm taking her to the destination. We're talking on the way. Just felt to ask her a couple of questions and drill in. But there was a sense of openness there. And the Holy Spirit gave me this opportunity to share about Christ with someone who had never heard about Jesus before. And I can't believe that. It, in, in a very anecdotal way, I kind of felt like, you know, we're living in a post-Christian society almost, very secularised. And she goes, I've never really heard about this before. And so I got to share Jesus with her. Now, I don't know if you've heard of this before, but there's a little um, scale called the angle scale. And it, you start at minus 10, which is kind of people who have never heard about Jesus. Or you might be minus 9. They might have a, a concept of God, but that might be it. And our role really is just to bump them along to the point of conversion where they receive Jesus, which is zero. And then you get into the pluses where they begin to grow in their faith. And I had this real sense this week as I spoke to this young girl that I just bumped her along maybe a notch. And I even got to pray for her, got to pray for her arm, prayed for healing, prayed for this nerve that had been severed to be regenerated and for God to do a miracle. Now, I would probably never see her again, but I've been faithful to do my bit. And if I'd listened to my weariness, if I'd listened to my body and my mind that's saying, hey, I'm tired, I just want to shut down and finish the day, I may not have had that opportunity. I may have just missed it altogether. But glory to God, he gives us strength when we feel weary and we feel weak. And Jesus, this is where he's at. Let's pick up the story in verse 7. It says, Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? So here we see another key to Jesus sharing about the Father and, and what we can do also to share with others. He was prepared to actually forego cultural sensibilities and boundaries because Samaritans here we see don't associate with Jews. But Jesus, he was happy to look past that. He saw an opportunity in fact, it was a very practical situation. He wanted a drink of water. And so for us too, what are we prepared to look past? Maybe there's culture, maybe there's socioeconomic status, maybe there's other factors where we think, hey, that's too uncomfortable 
for me to go there. But letting those things go and being prepared to be all things to all people is actually a key to being able to share your faith. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23, Paul says this again. He says, even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under the law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring some to Christ who are under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles, so here we have a different group, he says, who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart. From that law, so that I can bring them to Christ, but I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Here we see, Paul says, I try to find common ground with everyone. And so often when I'm sharing faith or feel prompted to share faith with someone, and I get these opportunities a lot now that I'm out driving from time to time, um, I'm just looking, hey, what are you into? And I love what um, James from C3 Camden shared the other week. If you're into footy and they're into footy, talk about the things that you have in common. Just be a great human being who believes in Jesus. Just be a normal, regular person that's into life. And this here brings uh, connection connection with others. And so Paul's here trying to find common ground with everyone, doing everything he can to win some. And I find that when I'm just in my zone, like I enjoy art and and uh, I enjoy, you know, the, the, the footy and things like that, and when I'm just in my zone enjoying life and I'm doing what I do, I can then connect with others who might be in my sphere of influence. And I find this is a great way to share faith. Let's have a look at verse 10. Jesus replied, If only you knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. So Jesus here is beginning to stir the woman's interest. But, sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again and I won't have to come here to get the water. Jesus piques her interest, and this is another thing. Here we have an incredible self-disclosure. Jesus is the living water. You know, there was uh, in Ezekiel, I think it is, there's the picture of the temple and the, the, the river that flows from the temple. And this is a picture, this was a messianic expectation, and Jesus fulfills this. And Jesus brings life to all of us. I know when I first became a Christian that you know, I experienced, I'd experienced the presence of God in my bedroom. In fact, I encountered Christ before I went to church. I picked up a Bible and read the Gospel of John and this presence came into my room and this thing filled what I can only describe as my heart, my inward parts, and I began to weep. I, began, I couldn't stand up. I would fall over. I couldn't, I was incoherent almost. And I was saying, what is, what's happening to me? And as I began to read these passages about the power of Jesus, about his presence filling me, I began to understand what was happening to me. Now, I don't go around having those types of experiences every day, but I believe the Lord allowed me to encounter him in that way so that I could understand his presence, his power, and the gift that is available to every person. And Jesus offers it to this woman. And I think one of the, the things that we can do um, is talk about our story. How did you encounter Jesus? What is it that led you to, to him? Has he touched your life in some way? What is it about Jesus that 
piqued your interest. And here we see Jesus offering it to this woman. Sharing with others about what Jesus has done for you personally is an incredible way of piquing their interest. And as James said a few weeks ago, you can't, they can't deny your story. They may say that's good for you, but they can't deny the truth of it because it did happen for you. Whether what they do with it is another thing, but you being faithful to your testimony. In fact, in the book of Revelations, it says that the people of God overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And I find when everything else gets stripped away, when you're under pressure, when the pressures of life are coming on you, I find, Lord, I remember when, you know, I slew the bear and I slew the lion and I slew that giant and you'll do it again. Often it's your testimony that will keep you anchored but also speaks to the people about what God can do for them. So don't lean on circumstances. Don't lean on fair weather. You can't lean on these things because ultimately the Bible describes that as shifting sand. It's the bedrock that you build on, the Word of God, the Scriptures, your testimony, the Holy Spirit, the people of God, and everything else will find its place around that. And so Jesus piques her interest and um, says, I've got this life for you if you're willing to receive it. And then he says to her in verse 16, go get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Jesus here relies on the Holy Spirit to get an insight into what's happening for this lady. Now, he's not belittling her in any way, but what he is doing is gently opening up the reality of where she's at. He's spoken about living water and now he's showing her an area where this living water can make a difference in her relationships. And often I find that using our spiritual gift in times when we're sharing faith with others is key. Now, this might be something as simple as the gift of hospitality. You might make someone a cup of tea and give them your time and show kindness. Here Jesus gets a an insight, a spiritual insight. And we see in 1 Corinthians 12, 8, Paul refers to this. He says, To the one person the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special, special knowledge. Special knowledge, so the gift of knowledge. What's your gift? In, in 1 Peter, it says that all of us have been given a spiritual gift. And it says, use it to serve one another. Our gifts open doors. Don't try to do it like someone else does it. Don't try to be apologetic if you're not an apologist. Use your gift. Just be friendly, be kind, be be generous. Talk about what Jesus has done for you and leave the rest to God because the Holy Spirit is the one who seals the deal. You've just got to do your part. So sharing faith in that sense isn't hard. We see Jesus here doing it in very natural ways. He's tired, he's weary, he asks for a drink. He gets this opportunity and things just begin to open up. And we live in a world where there are real needs. There are pressing needs. And you and I have a testimony. We have something to give. What is your gift? I'd ask you that today. What's your spiritual gift? Sir, the woman said, verse 19, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim It is here at Mount Gerizim uh, where our ancestors worshipped. And so here the woman kind of balks. It gets a bit sensitive now. She kind of begins to deflect. And I don't know if you've shared faith with someone before, but I remember actually sharing with a Jewish woman in my workplace and I began to share about Jesus. And she'd been happy to have the conversation up to a point, but as soon as it got very close, close to a sensitive issue, she began to deflect. And this is what this uh, Samaritan woman does. She begins to make it political. You know, let's, um, let's talk about whether it's at Jerusalem or Samaria where we're meant to worship. How often can conversations about faith get politicised? But, you know, Jesus sees past this and he's not put off. He's not put off by her objections. He's not put off by her deflecting. In fact, 
he replies uh, with love. In fact, he goes in verse 21, Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman. He's very kind. Believe me, dear woman. The time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the, um, but the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And don't we know that today? We are the fruit it doesn't matter whether it's in Jerusalem. It doesn't matter whether it's here in Shell Harbour. It doesn't matter whether it's in Iceland or any other place on this earth. We have access because of what Jesus did on the cross. He died for our sins. He rose again. We are justified because of our faith in him and his perfection. So we can worship now wherever we gather. Where two or more gather in my name, he says, I am there. Jesus responds to the deflection to try and politicise that conversation with love. He says, dear woman. And I want to remind us today when we're sharing faith with others, don't forget to be kind. Because if there's a point in that conversation where it gets a little bit hairy, all of a sudden we feel like we've either got to defend ourselves or defend God. God is big enough to defend himself. And so you don't want to get caught up and I, I worked in a very feminist um, organisation and uh, I was the only Christian there, actually probably one of two or three, but they were in different groups. But in my particular team, I was the only Christian and I was a pastor. And, um, and people were into all kinds of lifestyle choices and, and I'm here and I had to try to um, represent Christ in the best way I could and often I found it was through kindness and love and acceptance not judging, and I remember speaking to my boss and we left within two weeks of each other. I was working at Bernardo's in child protection and, um, and this particular boss said to me, and they were celebrating Rainbow Day and everything else, and, and you know, it's their choice, you know, to, to, to live the lives they want to lead, you know. Who am I to tell them otherwise except to represent Christ in the best way that I can? And so she said to me, you've changed the way I see the church. I thought, well, thank you, Lord. And that was just through persistently, and they did everything they could at times to aggravate. And with this Jewish lady that I've been sharing faith with and, you know, things, you know, there was just so many opportunities just to, and I wasn't responsible for what they did with it either. And so often we can feel the pressure when we're sharing faith with people to be responsible for the outcome. But remember, we're just bumping them from minus 10 to maybe minus 7. And then someone else will bump them to minus 2. Then someone else seals the deal because the sower and the reaper work together. But God brings the growth, yeah? That's what the Bible says. So we've got to really unshackle ourselves from fear, unshackle ourselves from the expectations. See, we, we don't have to manage people's expectations. God will do that. He is the one who brings salvation. We just have to share about our experience. It says in Romans 2.4, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? So Paul here is saying, in fact, in another translation, it says the kindness of God leads you to repentance. Don't forget kindness in the conversation when it does turn political or if it does take a turn you're not expecting, just show kindness. It will win hearts. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, verse 25, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Jesus is bold and unapologetic about the gospel and so should we. He's bold and unapologetic. He doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't kind of, you know, kind of get insecure or kind of meek. He just says straight out, I am the Messiah. And there's going to be opportunities where you and I can share about Jesus and we can boldly say, 
Jesus is the saviour of the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We had the opportunity the other night to share with our double-digit youth, those who are 10 and over, and we shared the gospel with them. And, uh, you know, if you've never kind of read a succinct account of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, historically speaking, is the most accurate and verifiable account of the gospel. And Paul outlines it. I might read it to us today. And we got to share this with the young people the other night. And four of them made decisions to follow Jesus and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Wasn't that good? Got to prophesy over them. And and there were words that we got in the spirit, words of knowledge like Jesus. You know, Jesus had the spirit without measure. So he's doing miracles left, right and centre. We don't have the spirit without measure, but we do have the Holy Spirit. And um, he will do uh, miracles and words of knowledge and things like that can come through us too. But we shared the gospel with them first. We didn't just kind of speak things from the Holy Spirit that were out of context. We told them about the Father's love. We told them about Jesus and him rising from the dead for their sins. And then we were able to minister in the Holy Spirit within that context. But let me read to you. Paul outlines the gospel, and this is a good one to remember. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 9, it says, Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then and you still stand firm in it. It is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was the most important and what had also been passed on to me, Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all of the apostles. Last of all, as though I'd been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I am least of the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. So Jesus lived, he died, he was raised again. We are justified um, from our sins because of what he has done for us. This is the gospel. This is the good news that we now have access to the Father. The curtain was torn top from bottom, top to bottom. We have access now to the presence of God. And uh, we have this beautiful message that we can share. And so Jesus shares the gospel with this Samaritan woman. He says, I am the Messiah. And she believes because we'll see the fruit of it. In fact, it says in verse 27, just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. And here we see the fruit. Now, you and I might might not see the fruit always of our, um, our sharing with others. Some will sow, some will reap. God causes the growth. Some might water as well. But here we see in this particular case the people from the village come out and great ministry occurs and there's fruitfulness. That's our uh, role in in all of this. We're called to be co-workers with him. Jesus says, I've called you to bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so I pray today that you and I would have the boldness, like Jesus demonstrates here, just to share our story, to share with the world that is under pressure at the moment a world that's hurting. And so practically, what do we do with all of this? We hear this great story about Jesus. We hear about him. We see some keys maybe to how to do that effectively, how to take the pressure off ourselves and let God do his work. But number one, just three little points, next 30 seconds. Be ready with your story. And I just encourage people to have a 30-second version. So if, you, if, you're, if you've got a quick encounter with someone You get an opportunity. What's Jesus done for you? Maybe just in one area of your life, in 30 seconds. Also have a five-minute version. So if you're sitting down and 
You get an opportunity over coffee. And you can explain the gospel to someone, what Jesus has done for you, and maybe even take them to the Bible and be able to show them something um, of the gospel. That's really good practically. Be ready with your story. Number two, don't force the situation, but ask the Holy Spirit for opportunities. There are many people. In fact, Jesus walked past many people, and it wasn't based on need, but it was based on faith. And sometimes, you know, the Holy Spirit will show you an opportunity or a situation where you've just got an open door to share something about Jesus and just take that in faith. So don't force the situation. Thirdly, build relationships with people where possible. The best way to see someone make a lasting decision and to receive Christ is where you have a relationship where you can walk with them through that journey and help them. Uh, overcome and uh, make those initial steps. And so I want to pray for us today, if that's okay. And I just want to invite us to stand if we could and might get our musicians to come forward. And as I said at the beginning of this message today, I want to pray for us. I want to open up the altar and pray that God would strengthen uh, you and I in this season. We're living in a world where there is stress and pressure and concerns about the economy and wages and inflation and all of these things. But in the midst of that, you and I are a light to the world. We're the salt of the earth. It's a beautiful phrase, actually, the salt of the earth. When you think about salt, you don't just eat handfuls of it, do you? Like it's pretty, pretty gross. But actually it's scattered loosely And sparsely, God has scattered you and I throughout the earth as salt to bring perspective into lives, into hurting lives. But today you might have a need, and I want to just invite our prayer team just to come and join me. And just as we worship in this last song, if you have any need at all to be strengthened in this season, to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit, or if you want to be bold, and share and ask the Lord for, your, for the Holy Spirit to share what Jesus has done in and through you, that you could be effective in your faith. I want to pray with you this morning too, but if there's any need at all, I just sense the Holy Spirit wants to strengthen lives, to empower lives. And you might just come through, you think, I don't know what I need. Come forward. I want to pray with you. And let's take this opportunity, if you're going to, Remain standing just to enter in and worship in this place. But just before people begin to come forward, just as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you don't know the Father's love, that there's a God in heaven that has created you for a purpose, that he loves you, then today you can know his love. Jesus died for your sins, for my sins. And he rose again so that you and I could be justified, made right with God. Our world is full of brokenness and sin. And Jesus came to pay the price for that. And today you can know him. You can know the Father's love. You can be filled with eternal life. And today, if that's you, or if you want to make a recommitment today to Jesus, you feel like that relationship just needs strengthening today. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed right now, I just ask you just to raise your hand. I'll see that and I'll acknowledge that and get you to put your hand down again. If that's you today and you want to receive Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, today I pray for all of us in Jesus' name. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would strengthen us and fill us Lord, we pray for the world that we live in, for the community that we live in here in the Illawarra. Lord, we pray that your spirit would go forth, that, Lord, we would go forth. We are the light of the world. We thank you, Jesus, today for the good news that you save and that you transform lives. We pray today, Lord, that as we lean into you, that, Lord, you would encounter us and strengthen us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we just sing this uh, song together?
And I'd invite you just as you're ready to come forward and we're going to begin praying. Oh, 